Hi, I'm Christine Noe, Director of Gifted Education for DESE, and I'm here to introduce our next speaker, Phyllis Paisley. Phyllis is the Director for Missouri Alliance for Arts Education and has served in that role since July of 2020. Prior to that, Phyllis was uh, working with students in the Pattonville School District as an elementary music specialist and with teachers as a lead resource teacher for K-12 vocal and general music. Some of you have actually already met Phyllis as she attended several of our virtual meetings and professional development in the spring and summer of 2020. As a certified teacher with degrees in both music and elementary education, Phyllis has a deep appreciation for meeting the diverse needs of all students, including those students identified as gifted learners. Combining that knowledge with a passion for the arts and a desire to work for positive change, well, you've got a person uniquely situated to share some new ideas about reaching gifted learners in new and creative ways. Please join me in wel welcoming Phyllis Paisley. Well, thank you, Christine, for that introduction. And as she said, I'm really happy to be here today to share some ideas with you. And I'm going to be sharing a bit about my learning journey since taking uh, on the role of executive director for the Missouri Alliance for Arts Education. I hope it will inspire your work with your students. MAAE has had a long relationship with the Gifted Association for Missouri, but I felt as I was getting started that I had a lot more questions than I had answers. And so I began learning. I began listening in with uh, colleagues on sessions that Christine was leading, learning about the needs of gifted students and their teachers, learning about all the different structures there are in Missouri and common concerns that gifted teachers share. And what I had was the beginnings of an idea. Um, I began learning about project-based learning I began seeking resources and processes and looking for materials that I thought would be of help. And I think I've gathered some really useful pieces of information that I hopefully will be of use to you. The Missouri Alliance for Arts Education is a nonprofit service organization. It connects Missouri's communities in dance, music, theater, and visual arts, and coming soon, also media arts. When the Missouri Learning Standards were recently adopted, that was a fifth area that uh, is under the umbrella of fine arts. Our mission and our vision are to support all Missourians, every school, every child, every day. MAAE's relationship with GAM is long and, and has a storied history. Um, we share many things in common, in addition to our lobbyist, Kaina Iman. Um, she works on behalf of both organizations and uh, brings us a lot of knowledge and experience and helps us in the political arena. MAAE believes that the arts and arts education are of great value. In fact, we think they are essential. And we believe that learning comes alive whenever the arts are involved. And one of my favorite things to share is about the word aesthetics. Aesthetics is often associated with the arts. And what I think is interesting when you look at the word aesthetics, when the arts are removed, sometimes you have an aesthetic, which is a loss of vitality. And so MAAE is just supporting every teacher as much as we can to involve the arts as much as we can. A lot of our work is involving arts advocacy and we have five different areas that we approach as we're looking at that. Today's presentation in fact is in the promote category and it's a way of involving the arts and working on this project the Mo you know and exploring Missouri's legacies in your own little corner of the state celebrating Missouri's bicentennial. Coming up very soon, celebrating 200 years after August 10th, 1821, when Missouri became the 24th state to join the union. 
And so as a part of MAAE's work in connecting with other entities, we found ourselves uh, a part of the Bicentennial Alliance and learned about the Missouri Community Legacies Project. And we're really lucky today. We have Michael Sweeney with us, who is going to share a little bit more. Michael works uh, as the Bicentennial Coordinator, and he is also with the State Historical Society of Missouri. Michael Sweeney, a native of Kansas City, holds a PhD in American Studies from the University of Kansas and a master's degree in Library and Information Science from the University of Missouri. He previously worked at the Kansas City Research Center as a staff historian and senior research specialist. Sweeney rejoined the State Historical Society of Missouri in his current role in 2017 after a stint as director of collections at the American Jazz Museum in Kansas City. Michael, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you, Phyllis. I always, I appreciate this opportunity to, to talk a little bit about some of the opportunities that are out there for people to get engaged. Great. Well, what can you tell us about the Missouri Community Legacies Project? So Missouri Community Legacies is one of a number of what I would call community engagement projects that we developed for the Missouri Bicentennial. Um, the main mission that we've set for the Missouri Bicentennial is to use the occasion uh, to promote a better understanding of Missouri's communities, counties, regions, people past and present, right? So we're trying to figure out ways and opportunities for local communities to articulate who they are and what they're about and to find ways to share those and hopefully look um, not necessarily its sameness, but to think about points of shared somethingness, right? Those things that sort of unite us together, um, but also kind of maintain all those unique things that make our, all of our communities uh, different. Um, and so this is one of those projects. And Missouri Community Legacies in particular uh, was um, kind of designed around this idea of um, thinking about the um, traditions, meaningful places, institutions and organizations that make our communities vibrant and um, interesting and unique uh, places. Sometimes those things are really representative of the community. Sometimes they're really unique aspects um, of the community um, with a little more substance behind them, uh, right? So uh, Missouri Community Legacies um, involve people basically finding ways to share. It's, it's providing a way for people to share information about those things that make their community unique. And the outcome of that is um, kind of a three to five page, I always say book report style paper, uh, some photographs and any other things that, that might um, help illustrate um, either the tradition or the place or the institution or whatnot. And that could be uh, maybe a poster, maybe it's a map, um, maybe it is um, a souvenir flyer, maybe it is um, um, now, notice you mentioned mostly two-dimensional kinds of artwork. Mm -hmm. Would video or something like that? Be yes. Oh, great question. Yes. Oral histories, video. Um, there's all kinds of ways of sort of, um, of getting it, getting at that information. Um, and those are excellent. Those are excellent examples. How would you recommend someone get started if they were interested in, in taking part? Sure. Okay. So, um, so Missouri Community Legacy Project has to be, um, to be a, a tradition of some sort. Um, it can be a meaningful place or institution or organization. So the other important piece is it has to be contemporary, existent, ongoing, right? So it's a part of life right now. It may be a historic building, but it's gotta be a historic building that is still there and standing that people walk by and see today. Um, so, right, so that's the first thing to think about. But then, you know, you need to start asking yourself some questions, right? Um, you know, um, what is something representative about our community? Um, I'm a Kansas Cityan, uh, some, you know, very famous, um, the shuttlecocks outside of the Nelson Atkins Museum of Art, right? Those are things that are sort of around all the time. Um, we use it to represent the city all the time. But maybe it's just asking the question, does your community have a yearly festival? Almost every community does. Um, whether it is apple butter making days down in um, Mount Vernon, maybe it, it is Pershing days up in Laclede, Missouri. Almost every community has a year, a year with festival. So that, that would qualify for this. Uh, maybe a local legend. Um, good example would be if you're from Marshall, Missouri, Jim the Wonder Dog, uh, right? The story of, of the, the dog that could magically uh, pick Kentucky Derby winners. Do you have a culinary tradition? There's another interesting one, right? Um, whether that is toasted ravioli um, in, in St. Louis or, or something else, right? Um, is there a place? Is there a place that your community treasures? 
Um, maybe it is a city square. Maybe it is a public park. Um, right, and you can start asking then questions about all these things. How is this park used? Has it always been used this exact way? How did this park come to be? Um, what happens over the course of a year in the park? Right, all kinds of questions uh, about these these places and traditions and, and whatnot. That sounds great. Um, I I look at this list of questions that's on the on the website, and it makes me think of something that I think would be applicable to to students and and adults of all ages to just kind of embrace their community and try to get to know it a little bit better. Well, and I think one of the things I might interject here, I mean, I think particularly for students, um, you know, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like this, is, this has to be an individual person's project. Sometimes working together and having those conversations is kind of the most valuable part of this, right? I mean, there is something that shared memories that suddenly come up that you didn't really think or recognize before. I'm thinking about our our residents in um, extended care facilities or, or retirement facilities who have been on lockdown for so long. How wonderful would it be for a Zoom call or something to, to gather some of those stories about a, a specific place? How wonderful for both the student and for the adult who has lived in a certain place and could provide that depth of knowledge and experience. Definitely, but I mean, because I think that kind of activity does some productive work, right, uh, for everyone involved. Um, let me give you an example of, of this. So um, one of the existing Missouri Community Legacies is about Juneteenth in Kansas City. Um, if you're not familiar with Juneteenth, right, it's celebrating June 19th, 1865, uh, the day the last group of slaves finally heard about uh, emancipation over two years after the fact. Um, and they have a celebration in Kansas City. It has been around since 1980. Part of what was building that file was to visit with the organizers and the previous organizers, right? And sort of this chain of, <laughs> of events and how today's festival, the festival we have today, is, is connected to this older festival. Um, yeah, and so that, that oral history then got to be part of the file, right? Um, but the experience of, of being engaged in that conversation in some ways was the most beneficial part, right? What do you envision that the practitioners will take home? I, I think you just alluded to it a little bit right there with your example about Juneteenth. Sure. Um, you know, I, one of the things that, that I think we often neglect, um, particularly I think because as you know, 21st century, we tend to be, we move around a lot, right? Uh, we tend to be very individual focused. I mean, I think our, our technology devices kind of push us in that direction. We don't spend a lot of time um, thinking about kind of our shared stories um, and therefore feel a little less grounded, right? Um, this provides an opportunity to think about some of that. What makes home home, um, you know, and why is it something we should protect and take care of and continue to cultivate? Um, experience I had at a you know, local church um, that uh, Czechoslovakian church um, and Every year they do a polka party and these folks all sang the Czechoslovakian song and they did the dances and they're all old. Um, I remember training my wife going, you know, in 25 years, um, no one's going to know these songs. Um, right, but those, those songs and those dances and those things that we do that are just part of community um, are the things that help us feel grounded and connected across time. Um, and that's just kind of important for, I think, think our well-being um, in the world. Um, it makes us better, e it makes it easier, I think, sometimes to solve difficult problems when we, it helps us to agree without being disagreeable when we recognize that we actually share actually quite a lot. Um, and, and this, so I, I mean, I don't want to oversell this, but I think the activity of thinking through those things together with other people, um, I think that does some great work beyond just, hey, I provided a report to tell you about this great thing that happens in our community. There's the work that's involved in actually doing it that I think is a positive um, for the people involved. And so, right, bicentennials and things like it, um, we could be doing this work anytime, right? Um, the thing about bicentennials is it provides us an occasion, provides us a reason to do some stuff we should be doing anyway. Um, so I hope that that's one of the things that gets taken away from this. I was taking a look through the resources on your website and was frankly stunned that there was so much there that I did not know about. And um, I also noticed that there 
were, uh, there was a toolkit to help yeah. people get started. Can you talk yeah. a little bit about that toolkit, please? Um, it certainly spells out the procedure. So here, here are the practical things you have to do, right? A, a, a complete version of this includes this paper. It includes this many photographs. It includes filling out this piece of paper and whatnot. But also that that guide is there, the toolkit is help is there to help you sort of think through some questions. I would recommend um, teachers if the, if this is something that that is is of appeal and and will be beneficial to your students to read through the entire toolkit. And I just wanted to know, are there any particular resources that are on the website that you would encourage people to visit that you wanted to speak about? Certainly. Well, I, I would say our, our list of completed Missouri Community Legacies one kind of continues to grow, um, and you'll find examples. I mean, one of the things is just to think through some examples of what other people have done and how they've done it. That shouldn't limit you by any stretch of the imagination, right? Spending time with the resources of the State Historical Society of Missouri. Um, we're in the history business, but part of the history business is about um, the present. Well, I know I had a lot of fun kind of crawling through the archives a little bit, and, and I hope that many of our listeners will do the same thing. Michael, thank you so much for no, Thank you, Phyllis. Today. I appreciate the opportunity to share um, about the project and the program, and I hope that people can get excited about, like I said, engaging in their communities. And... I, I do, too. Thank you again. No problem. So I have pulled some of those resources together for you here that are found on the State Historical Society of Missouri website. And I will also share those in the resource document that accompanies this webinar. So another something that happened on my learning journey was I attended a webinar about place-based education that was uh, sponsored by ASCD. And one of the things that was most compelling about it was that it was an interdisciplinary approach, which aligns with uh, the arts in education. It was also aligned with the Missouri Legacies Project in that it takes the larger community as a part of the classroom. And finally, what I had been learning as I listened in on the uh, gifted sessions with Christine is that it was in inquiry-based and involved elements of design thinking, which were very, very much evident in the project-based learning that I had been learning about. Um, so I did a little dig digging and found that there are several schools here in Missouri that are already utilizing place-based education, including Southview Elementary in Kearney and Glenwood Elementary in West Plains, along with Fairview Elementary in Columbia. And these last two, Glenwood and Fairview, are part of the Teton Science Schools Collective or Network. And um, I hadn't heard about that before this either, but they all utilize place-based education. And there's another one on the horizon, the Atlas Charter School that's opening in 2021 is uh, also going to be utilizing place-based education as their foundation or, or one of their pillar points. Um, in the course of learning about place-based education, I also found information on project agriculture. And since Missouri has several locales that agriculture plays a tremendously important role, I included them as a resource. Um, but really, all of these initiatives have something in common. And in the place-based education world, they say that it feeds three birds with the same seed, boosting student engagement, academic achievement, and a sense of personal efficacy within each individual student. It forges strong bonds within the community and improves the quality of life and economic vitality of each region. And finally, um, it helps students feel like they're really making a, dif a difference, a tangible contribution to their local community. Learning takes place on site, in the schoolyard, and with community environment. Um, I'm not gonna read all of these principles, but I list them here on the screen to help you know some of the tenets that underline this work. And there are a couple that were particularly, well, they spoke to me. And one was that learning is interdisciplinary. And it's something that we have noticed for a long time. As long as you remain in your lane or in your silo, you are isolated from so many other things. And the fact that this brings that learning 
all together and that it is founded in regional and global issues seemed like a match for this Mo You Know project. And um, there's one other element here that place-based education programs, once the school kind of buys in, it isn't an extra, it isn't an add-on. It is actually embedded and woven into everything that the school does. And let's face it, we've all had experience with the one more thing that you're trying to add to your plate. And this actually just tries to take something off of your plate and, and put it together in a more interdisciplinary way so that learning happens that is relevant and holistic and meaningful for kids. So if you'd like more information about place-based education, um, I encourage you to visit their website, The Promise of Place, and please visit Stories from the Field. It is a wealth of really inspirational projects that are really ready to go or could be ready to go without a lot of, um, of extra legwork on your end. So um, I picked out five that I just want to bring to your attention and I chose these five because they involve the arts in some way and they're also connected to a local community which would also lend itself well to the Missouri Community Legacies Project. So in this first example, um, Alberg's Bread and Butter happened in Vermont and kindergarten students were visiting a dairy farm and bakery and they ended up writing cookbooks and a play um, that had some food elements involved in it as well. Um, and there are lesson plans and outlines of the curriculum at www.vtfeed.org. Another thing I discovered is an outdoorsman, uh, two outdoorsmen who were telling their stories about changes over time and how the equipment has changed and the landscape has changed over the years. And they have a, a video that is awesome. Another example I wanted to share with you is the Sutton History Questing Project, where they interviewed members of the community, community elders, um, and dealt with elements of architecture within their town, physical features, water sources like rivers and, and different things, and then ended up with an art show and a guidebook so that members of their town could go and visit these various places and learn about their town's history. And that just seemed so wonderful, especially in this time of social distancing, where you could put together a project and then people could follow it at their own pace in their own time. Another one that I thought was really cool was this Groveton Heritage Pro Project. And they ended up putting together an oral history and working with some local musicians to, um, to go along with that. And I, it just sounded great. That was uh, in Grove, New Hampshire. And then the last one I'm going to share with you is in regard to Louisiana vo Voices. There were so many very cool things in there that I just decided to turn you loose and let you know about Louisiana Voices. But one of the things had a middle school history club, which uh, was like they took weekends, they just took to the streets of New Orleans and uncovered landmarks and people and, and history. And this naming activities project I thought was so cool dealt with a person's personal history by interviewing their family members. How did I get my name? Um, or where did our family name come from? Or does our family name have a meaning? Or does my name have a meaning? And uh, I just thought that was such a cool, cool project. And this last one was specific to Louisiana immediately after Hurricane Katrina. It was a project of using a Japanese storytelling tradition for healing. And the students drew stories and then sh on, on several pieces of cardstock, I think it was six for each, each kid um, to tell their story. And it was incredibly healing. And as I reflect on the collective trauma that we have as a nation, it just seemed like such a fit for certain situations. If kids have a story they need to tell that utilizing this Japanese storytelling tradition and helping them get a chance to tell their story. It just seemed really cool to me. So, so 
As I reflected on these examples of place-based education, I was reminded of what I'd learned from Michael Sweeney about the Bicentennial. And I thought, how cool would it be to adapt these ideas to Missouri's places, Missouri's buildings, Missouri's people, and affording an opportunity for each community to share its own story as gathered by the students within that community. Even with social distancing, it might be possible to coordinate with the activities of a local retirement center, to collect interviews, collect oral histories. It might be possible for your students to coordinate with a local historical society, create a walking tour, collecting digital images, and showing changes over time. All these could be published rem remotely for those of you who are social distancing or teaching virtually and instead of in person. And as I reflect on listening to a town's elders and hearing their stories, I was reminded of uh, Back to the Future, this clip from Christopher Lloyd talking about Old Man Peabody. Things have certainly changed around here. I remember when this was all farmland as far as the eye could see. Old Man Peabody owned all of this. He had this crazy idea about breeding pine trees. Even in a time of social distancing, your students could tell their story using theater and puppetry and video blogs, podcasts, just a variety of things. Another thing that I learned about in my brief exposure to place-based education is that there are related issues and initiatives with resources that could guide educators who want to move in this direction, I discovered the Litzinger Road Ecology Center. It is like 15 minutes from my house and I didn't even know that it existed. But they are interested in helping people map their community. Um, and they purport it because it helps place individual people, particularly students on the map, building a sense of place in the world and also placing local issues on the map, enabling better investigation and analysis. And some of the projects that they have done are amazing. Water quality stuff um, about environmental impact on new builds and patterns of racial and economic segregation. But all of these are just a natural way to facilitate student voice and student choice in designing relevant and authentic learning. It sounded really exciting. So I did some more exploring and I found this little trailer on their website. Check it out. Projects that they have done have included community mapping and they're partnered with dozens of schools. I didn't even know they were partnered with one of the schools in my own district. They also have tutorials on their website that show you how to do that community mapping and opportunities for professional development. Now some of their um, offerings have been postponed or delayed with COVID, but still this is just an amazing resource right in my own backyard and I feel I feel just so wonderful to have the opportunity to share it with you. Maybe you already know, but I sure didn't. And maybe there's somebody else who didn't know either. So please check out the Litzinger Road uh, site and consider using the concept of place in working with students to not only meet Missouri learning standards, but also to help celebrate Missouri's bicentennial. 
So the Missouri Alliance for Arts Education is, of course, involved in arts and education in all the areas of visual arts, theater, music, and dance. And we're also very strong proponents of arts integration and the use of, of STEAM principles in school. And for those who may not know how we define arts integration, um, I had a, a colleague say they thought it meant um, it was similar to racial integration. And although there can be racial, racial and cultural elements included in arts integration, it is really about looking at implementing learning, utilizing both non-art subjects and integrating fine arts into that, and then evaluating um, student progress and student growth in both areas. Um, it's differentiated a little bit from STEAM education in that there's more of a focus on problem solving in STEAM and that it may include any of the uh, areas that are listed in the STEAM acronym, science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. So both arts integration and STEAM, we are all for it because of course, as the Missouri Alliance for Arts Education, we are hoping that the arts become more pervasive and more embedded in, in all the things that we do. But um, I just wanted to share with you some, a few of the benefits that research has shown um, come about from involving the arts, more holistic student engagement, new dimension to the student artwork, that, student work that's being created, which incorporates artistic design principles. And of course, an improvement in communication skills and presentation skills, and a lot of positive social emotional outcomes as well. People find that their confidence is stronger and they just feel better about the product that they're producing. They feel more connected to it. So how do you incorporate the arts? I find a lot of my colleagues do not view themselves as an artist. I'm not an artist, I can't do that. And what I hope that you will consider is a shift in thinking. When you really look at what is an artist, the definition is here. Maybe you can look at this definition and think about these questions. Are you not a person who uses your hands and your mind to create new things? Do you appreciate beauty? Do you enjoy unstructured activities that include variety and choice? Do you enjoy interesting and unusual people, sights, textures, and sounds? Do you use creativity and imagination? Then you are an artist. And it's been my experience, most of my teacher colleagues are artists. So we are resolved, if you are a teacher, then you are an artist. However, you may lack training in a specific art form and its pedagogy. And that's where MAAE can help. We can connect you with teaching artists, arts integration specialists, job embedded PD in arts integration. We can connect you to artists and arts teachers in your district and in your community. And what's important to remember is that students are the creators. And as the educator, you will coach and guide and help focus their work. But it takes some of the pressure off that you don't have to necessarily be a performer to do arts integration work. You can do it as you do so many other things, as coach, as facilitator, as guide. Just be brave. It might be helpful to see arts integration in action. Project Lead the Way, uh, many of you have heard of. It, you may be personally involved in the project. I've spoken with a couple of gifted educators that that is part of their responsibility to lead certain elements of Project Lead the Way. In the video that you're about to see, fourth grade students were learning about simple machines and the conversion of energy. And in this clip, students demonstrate and deepen their understanding of the components and their function through movement.
Involving the arts adds vibrancy, adds dimension, and guidance is available from all these sources that you see here. Local arts teachers, community artists, arts institutions, museums, and MAAE. Involving the arts is something that you can do too. It doesn't have to be big. Start small, be fearless, seek inspiration, and seek support from people around you and open yourself to possibilities. We interrupt this webinar to bring you a brief commercial message. And it is from me. <laughs> <laughs> the Missouri Alliance for Arts Education is seeking educator partner teams to work with arts, arts integration coaches to, in support of the premise that arts integration activities improve student performance on statewide achievement tests. If we are able to find volunteers who will help us in this effort, they will work with a coach and design some specific lessons in the hope that we will be able to do uh, an item analysis and show improvement over time. What we're searching for are volunteers to help us in this effort. So if you are interested or you would help us spread the word, we are looking for teams that would include both a non-arts educator and an arts educator working together with our coaches to see if we can produce some evidence that is uh, supporting the premise that all of this is going to make a, a difference and make not only make learning more fun, but improve achievement as well. And we're back. To recap what we've talked about so far, the Missouri Bicentennial Community Legacy Project, the place-based education initiatives and community mapping, and finally, arts integration. So moving forward, Putting all those pieces together, we hope that you will consider being a part of that Legacies Project and sharing the Mo that you know or the Mo that your students know with, with the rest of Missouri. It would just be wonderful. However, some of the ideas that I've shared can seem massive and maybe even a little overwhelming. As I am sure all of you know, education is in a state of crisis right now. Everything that we have done in the past, the rules are all different. Everything has changed. Nothing is quite the way it was before. And it's not over yet. We are still working through all of that. So how could we get started even in a small way? What might help us get started tomorrow? So I reached out to our next guest, and it is Professor Jim Paisley. He can be found at truehistoryprofessor.com. And I'm so pleased to welcome him here today. To our next guest speaker, retired history professor Jim Paisley, who taught at Columbia College and who currently resides in Lake Ozark, Missouri. Professor Paisley is a published author and has conducted a variety of speaking engagements uh, on the history of Missouri and is a frequent contributor and regular guest on Morning Magazine, the radio program on station KRMS. He has been instrumental in cultivating a passion for history among his students, and he shared with me some ideas about how the historical research projects he has done with collegiate level students might be adapted for use with gifted and non-gifted students. And for full disclosure here, Professor Paisley is my brother-in-law. So I want to say thank you, Professor Paisley, for joining us today. And um, thank you so much for sharing those materials uh, with me earlier. And I, was, I really enjoyed looking at the materials that you shared on how the students captured uh, the history of a specific time and place, and that can be accessed by all learners. I was wondering, can you tell us uh, what led you in that direction? Sure. First, thank you very much for having me today. And, uh, I can tell you this is one of the most fun classes that I taught. We, the students got a lot out of it. I got a lot out of it. And I even wound up with a lot of the other professors sitting in on the class because they were fascinated with what, what we were doing. Uh, basically what triggered it was over the years, students had brought me all sorts of things 
to look at. Uh, they, you know, things uh, they'd ask if I could identify an item or provide the history behind items that they'd found in the garage or in grandpa's attic. And they included things like old letters and photographs and military memorabilia and antiques. And they ranged all the way from family Bibles that had their genealogy in them all the way to one of them brought in a letter signed by Adolf Hitler. So yeah, a lot of stuff. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That's mm -hmm. kind of amazing. It um, is. One of the uh, pieces that you shared with me had the students walk through a typical day, like a 24 hour period. And I really enjoyed reading about that to see what kind of footprint, uh, electronic footprint. I mean, we can recognize some of them, you know, all the selfies that you see on mm -hmm. social media, uh, that would be one digital footprint that people would leave. But, but other, it was just fascinating to me. I had not ever looked at it in that. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about how you got to that and, and what your students' responses were like. This was really a, a fun exercise. Uh, it's the first assignment I gave them in this course. And basically what I did is I said, you know, when you're looking at history, you're looking back sometimes hundreds of years. And I said, what will happen 200 years from now when people look back to try and find out information about you? What clues are you leaving? Now, it's interesting in that uh, I taught this course before Facebook and Twitter and all that was famous. So yeah, there's a lot of things there, but it's kind of fascinating all the other things that we leave behind that we don't realize. And the students themselves were fascinated. Uh, I asked them questions like, did you create any records of your activities, a diary, notes to yourself, a letter to a friend or a relative, an email message, a telephone message, you know, a voicemail. Uh, and then of course now Facebook and Twitter. Also, uh, you know, I asked if you, there would be traces of your activities appear in records elsewhere that somebody else created, like I took attendance for the course, that's a record. Uh, a friend's diary, notes, a calendar entry, uh, you know, again, a letter or an email from a friend, uh, and again, Facebook and Twitter. Would traces of your activities appear in school records, in business records? Did you write a check? Did you uh, uh, use your charge card? Uh, in the school or in the newspaper are there records? In government records, uh, did you go get your driver's license renewed or go to traffic court? All of these things are, are traces you left behind. And uh, also, would somebody be able to offer testimony, you know, somebody that's still alive that knew you and be able to talk about your activities and what you did? Other aspects of historical records aren't even records at all, but may still offer evidence about your life. Uh, traces you left behind in your daily activities, things like uh, surveillance cameras. You ever think about that? When you go to go to get gasoline or go to the grocery store or the bank, there's surveillance cameras. How about the trash that you throw away? You know, it all winds up somewhere, you know, the receipts and all sorts of things. Uh, material objects. Let's say 200 years from now, they come and, and walk into your, your home. Uh, are there coins, paper money, stamps, computers there? Uh, Things, uh, you know, just in your home, the type of uh, chairs you have, the furniture, uh, all sorts of things like that. Things in your bedroom. Uh, probably the most fascinating comment I got out of all of this as the students were, each one came and presented the things they found. One student made a, a fascinating comment and they said, basically, what would be most obvious is what if you tried to not leave any evidence at all to go off the grid? And we had quite a discussion about that. And it came out that we thought, if you're missing, it would stand out like a sore thumb because everything you leave every day, you're leaving evidence. If all of a sudden you disappeared, everybody try and find out where you went. Mm. Kind of an interesting concept. It is, it is mm -hmm. very. Um, thank you for that. And, and thanks for such a great idea of, of making history relevant, you know, putting it in, encapsulating it into, how it means something to an individual. Mm -hmm. um, one of the other projects that I thought was really approachable for really young kids was like the glorified show and tell. Yes. Um, I, and you, you sent me some resources of this thing. I had no idea what it was. And then yeah. there were photographs like from different angles and then clues. Um, I just think that's such a great, can you share any insights uh, about that artifact sharing? Um, it's, it's, your students. it's fascinating again uh, and it, I love that you chose the words show and tell because 
uh, when I tried to explain the exercise to the students, I used those very words. I said, this is show and tell. And I said, what we're going to do each, each week, we're going to come in and you're going to do show and tell with different objects and artifacts, et cetera. And, you know, these, the first one was just objects, art, things like uh, tools and inventions, uh, uniforms, fashions, even tombstones, you name it. We, you know, the, it was the gambit. And I'll give you some great examples. That's the best way to explain it. Um, the students went and tried to find something they could bring in for show and tell. One of them brought in their grandfather's Navy uniform from 1940. Uh, another one brought in uh, uh, souvenir glass. It was just a small glass, about this big, cut glass, and it was blue. And it was a 1904 World's Fair commemorative, commemorative glass. Uh, a bracelet made by an army soldier uh, that was made from scraps taken from a downed zero, a Japanese Zero airplane. And I asked, you know, well, where'd you get this? And she said, the soldier was my grandfather who fought in the war. And he made this this bracelet for his her, his, her grandmother. Um, an arrowhead collection found at Stark Caverns. Grandma's kerosene lamp. Uh, this one was pretty neat. Great grandma's quilt, which she made out of great grandpa's ties. I thought that was really, really cool. Uh, an antique flat iron. And then the student went on to talk about the history of ironing. You ever think <laughs> about that? Yeah, where'd that start? Um, corsets and their history. That was an interesting one. Buffalo nickel ring made by uh, the student's grandfather for his grandmother. Yeah, it was handmade. And then they brought in one, and it was funny because, you know, modern students aren't familiar with these things. It was a 70-year-old wherever juicer. In other words, to make orange juice, you know, <laughs> and they were all like, what is that thing? What do you do with it? You know, which was fun. And I, like I say, it got to the point where other teachers were coming in just to see what the students were bringing in every week. It was a really fun project. And one of the things that is so remarkable about that project is it not only is in alignment with the Missouri Legacies project where it's like a, a a place or a, t a time, but it's a reconnection to their family history too that Absolutely. was otherwise uncovered or, uh, or undiscovered. Yeah. Well, I noticed in the materials that you shared with me, you had some really interesting ways of looking at photographs, paintings, uh, visual representations of a time and place. Mm -hmm. And I'd love for you to describe that a little bit. And that would be a really easy project to do as well. I have the students bring in an old photograph. And uh, basically what I would tell them is say, study the photograph for several minutes and write down everything that you think is important. And then a key here, a, a neat trick is to take the photograph and divide it into quadrants. Just cut it into four equal sections and detail the important things in each section of that picture, okay? And then ask yourself, what's the subject of the photograph? What does the photograph reveal about its subject? Um, where's the setting, you know, time and place? Uh, what other e details do you observe? Are there old cars? Are there the fashion? Any number of different things, time of day, time of year. And on fine art, I asked him, I said, uh, research the artist. Who, who, who did the painting or, or the sketch or whatever it is? Uh, the date of the piece, the medium. What does the information about the artist and the medium and the su subject and the composition tell you about uh, that particular period of time? Um, what symbolism is used in, in paintings? We see that a lot. Um, how is perspective used? And what roles are the people portrayed? And, you know, a key thing here, when you're looking at a, at a piece of artwork, what's left out? What's not there? Sometimes that can answer questions as well. So these were all, again, really fun projects and really easy to do. I mean, it was, it was you know, it was a matter of the students at the hardest thing was picking what to bring in. I can imagine that. Um, in, in your writings, you mentioned sometimes there's a historical treasure in one's own, own home, an unpublished primary resource. And mm -hmm. you mentioned a few of those already. I was wondering, can you offer any additional su uh, suggestions about how teachers might help access materials? You bet. Well, as you said, one of the first places I would start would be the State Historical Society of Missouri. 
and that's just shsmo.org. And to all, they've got all sorts of digital records and everything, newspapers, uh, periodicals, just every kind of record you can possibly imagine. Well, it also gives you links to historical and geneolo genealogical societies throughout the state of Missouri. The links are in that first, uh, in, on that website. And it'll give you information about a particular town or a region. And often the resources are held by local and regional institutions and aren't available anywhere else. But this will give you the link and tell you who you need to contact to get a hold of them. Also, your county courthouse can also provide a wealth of information about the people of your community and their history as well. And for teachers and students alike, I wanna to emphasize to you that you should start at home. Sit down with your parents and your grandparents, teachers, you as well, and ask about your community and your family history. It's amazing what you might find. Now, going back to the, the State Historical Society, let me give you one example. I was there looking through old newspapers and they had papers go all the way back to the 1880s. I looked up my own name, Jim Paisley, and I looked and sure enough, it comes up, but the guy that I found was my dad. It was a picture of him three years old, sitting on the curb at the Christmas parade in 1903 in Columbia, Missouri. Wow. So, you know, the treasures are there. They are absolutely there. It's just knowing where to go to look. And like I say, I would start there with the State Historical Society and it will give you a wealth of information and links to link you to all these different things. Well, thank you so, so much. Thanks for your time. Thanks for helping me out. And thank you, just appreciate your time and your expertise. I really thank you. Anytime, I hope you all have fun. Well, that just about brings my sharing to a close for today. The beauty of the Missouri Community Legacies Initiative is that you can make it as small or as extensive as you like and customize your involvement to meet your students' needs. I also encourage you to integrate the arts into your lessons and reap the many social and academic benefits. How can you get started? I invite you to attend MAAE's free monthly professional learning community meetings we call Maine events. Maine refers to the Missouri Arts Integration Network and everyone, any subject specialization, any age level, are welcome to join us for free. These one hour Zoom sessions get you in touch with other teachers across the state and each contains a short presentation from some current arts integration practitioners. On November 2nd, we have Dr. Elizabeth Hogan McFarland and Carol B. Horst, music and visual arts instructors at the collegiate level who work with pre-service teachers in Cape Girardeau, Missouri at SEMO. And on December the 7th, we will welcome Molly Nevius and Amanda Martin Heyman. They work for the Spencer Art Museum at KU, and they're going to share their arts integration lesson plan archive with us. We have plans in 2021 to welcome the St. Louis Symphony Orchestra and a cadre of dance professionals. And we're also looking for other people who might wanna share their work in arts integration. So if you know some arts integrationists, Tell them to get in touch with me, director at moaae.org, and we will put them on the calendar. In the meantime, please reach out to the artists and arts educators in your community. The arts are a part of the whole picture and an excellent way of engaging the heart and body as well as the mind. The arts help people reach their goals and live more fulfilling lives. We encourage everyone to involve themselves more consciously and more deeply in the arts. We believe it will ultimately help make the world a better place. Thank you for listening today. And if you have any further questions or would like any information, please feel free to reach out to me, director at moaae.org or visit our website, www.moaae.org. Thank you for tuning in today. I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference and I hope you have a successful school year.